Morning and welcome to Coffee with Captain Pete, Bedtime Stories with Bethune. Depending on where you are in the world, we've got today here a special guest, Jason. Um, some of you have seen him a little bit before. Some of you might have seen him in Whale Wars. He was on he was on boat Earth Race Eddie Gill that went to Antarctica with me. Um, and he kindly lets me come and live in his house when, <laughs> when I'm in New Zealand. On a first, he was in the Air Force. He was in the, he was a, he was the Air Force first, then he became become a policeman. Dodgy character to be a cop, to be honest. <laughs> and then he's kind of had, had a life of leisure since then, really. I was at the university when we met. That's right, he was I too. To be an architect. And what happened with that? I invented something and said, so I sort of changed, changed directions a little bit. I was gonna, I was gonna come and say how qualified he is. Um, he's not actually qualified in anything, except except uh, lifestyle. Absolutely. And 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 what he does is, I'll, I'll show you it, but I can't rotate the thing around. But he does. He he's an. I, I, don't, I hate to say the word inventor because that has the crazy professor thing going on. But he he makes wood burners more efficient, and he does open fires and stuff like that. So he's like like I term, came up this term combustion engineer is what we're, <laughs> we're going. Anyway, he's going to help us today, and he's got a few thoughts on some things. Um, first off, I should point out he's got a man bun. We were discussing it. Just show everyone your man bun. Yeah. So we were discussing this the other day. So I remember I posted once before about the man bun, and it was funny how it polarised people. So you had basically you had all of the men said it looks shit. And women kind of liked it. But it was funny that the men who were saying it was crap, most of them couldn't actually get a man bun going. And he has, anyway. But the, the funny thing with his man bun, so this shows what sort of guy is, right? So he's been, he's, he's taken up surfing. It took him 50 years. He finally decided to give surfing a go, right? And he goes out, and his man bun kept, he was using those little tie things that women use where they, they tie their hair that's, up. That's, that's what's in there now. So, anyway, so it's got something, it's got one of those woman little ties in there at the moment. And he would go surfing, but when he'd fall in, it kept coming out. It's not up to out. man's activity. It's not, it's not up to man's activity. So, <laughs> so, what he started using is this thing. So, this is a, it's something you put on your plastic bags that you put in your freezer <laughs> so, so that's up on his man but anyway so that's that's jason uh he's gonna help us out today um so uh so he was a cop i'll get him actually tell us your best cop story because one of the things about people people if you're if, let's say you're an accountant you don't have many great work stories when you come home each night to tell your missus or your husband um cops jimmy have quite a few stories so i want you to give us give us one story of when you were a cop <laughs> So when, they, when you join the police and you, you first get sent out to your station after your 22 weeks training at the college, there's a bit of a tradition where they play a practical joke on you. And because you're so new, you just, you just got no idea. You never see it coming. Even the shrewdest of guys will, will still get caught out with it. So I, I was pelted with rotten fruit. It, it, um, but the, the funny story we had, we had a, the next guy that came onto section after me was, a, was a, a young fella. He was only about 22 or 23. And so when we set this guy up, we decided just to... Just a baby. Just I a baby. Mean, I remember when I was 22, I thought I was fully grown. Yeah. And I was about 20, It was about that age where I, I suddenly concluded I knew the, more than my dad, which actually I didn't by a long ways, but um, I kind of figured I had 22, just a baby. Anyway, continue. What happened yeah. to this baby? So I should, I should lay a bit of a foundation here. Is that one of the things you've got to be able to do as a cop is you've got to be able to swim. You know, you've got, to, you've got to have a certificate that you can swim 50 metres in under 40 seconds to actually get into the police. And then at the police college, there's a whole Just bunch as of an swimming. aside here, Wayne says he wants you to take your shirt off to see your progress. <laughs> <laughs> Let's leave that. Of course, continue, mate. I'll keep interrupting you. Sorry, mate. Got to carry on. So, yeah, you've got to be able to dive to the bottom of the pool and they, they put a rubber brick on the bottom. You've got to be able to tread water for 15 minutes, all sorts of stuff. So, right. so we've got this young fella. We, what we do is we, we set him up with a body off a beach. And he was going to have to swim about 50 metres out to get this body. And so we, we all rock up there. There's about four or five of us all sort of waiting in the background. This is in the day or this is at night? This is night time. We wait till night shift, two o'clock oh, yeah. in the morning, right? Oh, so, yeah. so two cars there to start with. And once, once the event gets started, the rest of us sort of creep in and we're all in there down, <laughs> down there to watch. And so we get this guy in there. And it was on a big boat ramp in Takapuna. And this guy couldn't swim. He was totally petrified of the water. It was just unbelievable. We just the sergeant's ordered him, get it and get the body. 
And this guy wouldn't go. He's like, I can't swim. So we're just, we're all sitting there shaking our heads. We couldn't believe it that this, this guy go all the way through the recruiting system in the police college and he, he couldn't swim. Snuck through the net. Yeah. So what happened? Did you fire him or what happened? So what happened is the, the sergeant called on the loud hailer. He says, if you can hear me, come closer to the shore. Because we're thinking we're going to get busted. And you can see the, the body, which is one of our colleagues, little panels like this. <laughs> He's wearing fins. <laughs> he comes in closer. And we managed to get this guy up to a bit this deep, t- touching his ribs. And once he gets close enough, he's, the guy just launches out of the water. This guy craps himself. So. so the practical joke did work. Right. Uh, so you wonder how he snuck through the recruitment yeah, process, got, don't you? Yeah, we've got no idea. So going that. in the water at night is quite... It's quite nerve wracking though. I don't know if th- mm. those of you out there, a few of you have probably done it, but I had a couple of things. One was um, when we're halfway across the Pacific on the last Pacific crossing I did, we used to have a thing where the crew would get out, we'd have a skinny dip in the middle of the night. So like, but I never did this with Jason on the boat to be fair, <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> we used to, we would get out and have a bit of a skinny dip at midnight. It's because we didn't have a shower on the boat. We would use it as a as a way to get clean. So we'd go in with some soap, lather up for a couple of minutes and so, and sometimes people might carry on for half an hour swimming actually but it was in the middle of the tropics so it was nice and warm but it's very nerve wracking first time you get in but um, one of my crew we, we all swim around next thing she starts yelling and screaming and we hauled her out and she had we don't know what it was but it could have been like a man of war but she'd already pulled whatever the jellyfish off was and it ended up it kind of wrapped around her hair so it had this tentacle that had gone around there and then there's, it had gone around her leg and sort of around this thing here and we pulled her out and we, we put some, I don't know what we put on, I might have put on vinegar initially, which is supposedly helps, whatever. And we think it was a man of war. And she ended up, she's got the scar right across, right across her breasts and down here, round on her thigh and then down on her calf from this. And we, we think it was two different tentacles. That, like the first one had gone around there and this was the second one around her leg. Mm. Um, and then the other time, the other one I will tell you about was, was when Jack and I broke into the De Beers diamond mine. Uh, so it was the very first mission that we did sort of as a, um, in terms of the television show. And so this is this is the outside place, the Atlas Bay, which is south of Luda, it's in Namibia. So we were trying to film this um, seal clubbing. And the it's a shark colony. So there's two places in the world where sharks breach. So breaching when they break the water. So one of them is down off, off um, South Africa. There's an island there, which is a seal colony. And the, so the, the, the great whites, they hang around there and they... They sit down low looking up, and even at night, if there's a little bit of starlight or moon or whatever, they will still see the shapes of the seals going over. So they'll breach at night, and then in the day as well, they'll come and take them. Some of the great shots you've seen are great whites. Anyway, so so we're breaking into this diamond mine. We're going to swim about a mile from offshore. We, we sneak in in this Zodiac, and it's a diamond mine, so we don't know where the patrols or anything are, and we're quite nervous about it. But we've got to swim, so we're dressed like seals, <laughs> all in black. So in. And I did ship my pants. I was so nervous. Um, and, and part of it is black water. When you get in black water, like even though the odds of us getting eaten by a shark are not that great, but it does play on your mind. And the fact that it's um, the fact that it's pitch black as well. Um, anyway, uh, so enough of that. Um, we've covered your man bun. <laughs> <laughs> so we first off, I was going to ta- oh, so a wrap up on the guns. So my last Facebook live we did, we covered guns, right? And um, the, it was really interesting. I thought it was going to be mayhem in the sand pit, but everyone kind of behaved. Um, but because often guns are a very polarizing issue in the states. But it was interesting. Afterwards, I had a couple of guys message me saying that they had sort of changed their opinion a little bit about guns, and that, that they sort of thought it was valuable having an outsider who's who's had experience with guns himself and who's, who's who visits a lot of countries, some that have serious issues with guns and some that don't. And um, it's under you know, like for example, Jason here. So I've got I've got some firearms downstairs. Jason, what do you got? What do you uh, got? I don't even know what he's got in the way of guns. <laughs> what have you got? I know you got something. I've got quite an arsenal, but only only a couple of them here. I've got a seven mil eight, just a bolt action hunting rifle. Okay. And, um, Which is so, so seven mil eight. It's a reasonable size caliber, mm. and that would typically be used in for hunting in New Zealand. So it's a bolt action. I don't think I've fired it in ten years. Hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it hasn't fired it in ten years. It's an heirloom to be handed down through the generations. And what else yeah. you got? And I've got a interesting one, a Javam semi-automatic two two, which is uh, French made. French made. Mm. Yeah. Okay. All right, so there we are. So he's got a couple of guns. He's in the police. You, what what do the police do with weapons in New Zealand? Because you do have access to them, don't you? But like in New Zealand, cops never carry guns. You'll never see a cop walking down the street with a sidearm 
or a, or a M16 or anything like that. What was the story of the guns and the cops? So it depends on where you are. If you're in a city, the sergeant will carry them. The sergeant's car, he'll have a station wagon and he's got a bunch of pistols and rifles in the back. So if, if there's a, an incident where firearms are required, there'll be a safe arrival point and he'll issue the, the firearms to the constables mm. at that point. Um, I work semi-rural, which is just out here over the water in Fonga Praia. And uh, so it was just two of us working the shift at any one time. And we, in the car, we had a little floor safe. So we had a pistol in the car if we right. needed it. So, yeah. How many times, all the years you did as a cop, how many times did you shoot? Not once. Not once. There you go. His entire time as a policeman, never fired a firearm up. But you, you had access to them in the car if yeah. you needed them. I, I was probably, I'll tell you what I used to do. I, for a while there, I was supposed to be on a two-man section and I was working on my own. Mm-hmm. And so technically we don't wear guns as policemen in New Zealand. But because I was working on my own at night shift, I used to put a little hip holster on. And, and, Naughty. And, yeah, but I used to. He was very subversive <laughs> in the police. <laughs> But the end, was a, about, in the end, he was a square peg in a round hole, yeah, I think. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but but in actual times where I had to to carry a firearm to a job where there might have been a threat, probably three times in seven years. So and you never had to fire around, but never had to pull it out of the holster. Mm. No. So so it is. It's really like like in New Zealand, plenty of people have guns, but mm. it's not the fact that it's very hard here to own a sidearm. Like you look at the crime stats for the states, sidearms cause most of the murders. The, the, the military weapons that everyone's frothing at the mouth over at the moment, like the AR-15s, which is not a military weapon, but kind of close. You put a bump sock and it does turn it into a, into a basically an automatic. The, the, the problem I have with those is the killing power of one person is so great. So you saw what happened in Texas. You saw what happened at that school yeah. recently. So even though not many murders are committed by automatic weapons or what I, you know, I'd consider a bump stock AR-15 automatic, the ability for a single person to wreak havoc is, is is astronomical, and that's why I think they should be they should they should simply ban bump stocks. I, I think there should be a stricter license law. Like in New Zealand, mm-hmm. for me, to, I've got a, I've got an AR-15. I'm I, I'm not psycho, and I think I'm a perfectly legitimate person to own it. I train on it, and we do use weapons overseas. Interesting, never AR-15s. It's always something else. But you need to have a more rigorous license process. So when I apply for my license, they interview my kids, my ex part, my ex wife. Um, and family members and friends to make sure that I'm a legitimate person to own it and that I'm not going to go psycho or whatever. And I think America needs to go seriously looking at the licensing system. And, you know, we're not saying yeah. take the weapons off, but yeah. but it needs to be a rigorous process so that, you know, if, if you've got a partner who thinks, oh, you know, Jason might come back and, and shoot me with his gun, you shouldn't be allowed a gun. You know, I think it's as simple as that. Because yeah. the stats are, there was a re- actually, the, the one stat I do remember from that, that thing last week was the a, a firearm in your home is 22 times more likely to kill a friend or a family than it is to kill a burglar or a criminal or a rapist. And and I do feel in America there's this there's this obsession about I want to one day be the hero and shoot a burglar or mm-hmm. shoot a rapist or whatever. And Still the odds are it's not gonna it's not not gonna be like that. Um, anyway, I didn't want I didn't want to cover two guns too much today, but. Thanks everyone for, for behaving last week because I thought it was going to turn into World Here, War Three. Here's a small one here about about uh, guns in the home. Um, a, a little change that they made to policy here in New Zealand was that a firearm has to be locked away. And mm. from a police or criminal perspective, what it means is that the act of unlocking the cupboard to get the firearm out shows intent. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, so you can arrest them yeah. and do them. That'd be... In the States, yeah. we don't really have first and second degree murder. It's murder or it's not here. But mm. in the States, I think first degree means shows intent. Whereas yeah. second, we, we, manslaughter might be equivalent. In New Zealand, if you kill someone accidentally yeah. or without intent, they class it as manslaughter. So that so might it's be. a certain amount of pre-planning mm. to go find the key, unlock the cupboard, pull the firearm out, mm. rather than simply just grabbing it and going. Yeah. Bang. So, yeah. Anyway, yeah. so enough, enough about guns. We're, we've moved on from that, <laughs> <laughs> thankfully. Um... Cougars. Right, so uh, there was a female female policeman, hence J- Jason's input on this. Um, so there was a female policeman in New Zealand. She was 43, and she's been having a relationship with an 18-year-old uh, model, or he's a guy that's working part-time as a model or something. And she's been fired because of it. Um, as a policeman, Jason, <laughs> what's your thoughts? Well, police are expected to 
display the high high end of the moral curve in a society. <laughs> what were you doing? <laughs> <laughs> so like, um, you know, in the 70s, even into the 1980s, uh, single police here in New Zealand were expected to live in barracks. You couldn't go live de facto with a, mm-hmm. with a, with a woman. So they are at the, the top end of morality, but theoretically. <laughs> but, but heck, uh, it's completely lawful, really, um, and completely completely expect I don't see a problem you know um, so it's been it's been acceptable hmm. for men in their 40s to have a 20 year old girlfriend it's like yeah like 20 years ago in New Zealand that was kind of frowned upon now hmm. no one really thinks twice about it and if it's if the boots are on the other foot good good honor yeah no I really I completely good honor uh, I don't see a problem with it at all and um, I'd be interested to see if she she might end up taking them to court and get a bit of a payout over that one um, because I don't, I don't think the police management have probably handled that very well. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah, there was that there was that thing doing the rounds a while ago on Facebook where it had, and it, was, it said Madonna's, you know, she's forty eight or whatever, and her boyfriend's twenty two. Oh, she's been doing it for years. And then there was J Lo <laughs> or something who had a, who had a twenty five year old boyfriend and someone else, and they said, you know, if you've if you've reached forty and you haven't found your boyfriend yet, don't worry because he hasn't been born. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Veronica, she, she, she's coughed up that she's been a cougar. Well, then we've probably, probably got half a dozen cougars on here. Probably. See, Veronica, was it... <laughs> Veronica, you, I can't have you speaking or whatever, but was it great? And do you see any moral issues with it? It's funny how we've got a... Marlene Ehrlich, she's probably... She's been a cougar too, I reckon. <laughs> it's funny how... Marlene a, lost the sound. There's a... Oh, t- t- <laughs> Veronica Lawson, she's just smiling at us. Hello, guys. I'm a cougar. I'm 53 and had a relationship with a 28 year old. Woo, you go, Carla. I'm not desperate or deranged and actually in really good shape and attractive. If it was turned around, the man would get a slap on the back. boy. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. Just don't go too young. Those are, those are the laws, LOL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. So anyway, um, moving on from cougars. So Jason and I have started, we, we've, had, uh, we've had three or four people that we've been advising them foolishly on weight loss. And it started with Jason. Jason grew a belly on him. <laughs> this, is, this is like when I first started training with I turned up and he had like probably 15 extra kilos floating down. He's a big guy, so, but, you know, it wasn't like he had a massive cut, but there was, was, was quite a little baby going on here. <laughs> so anyway, Jason got on top of it, and him and I started training together. And since then, we've been helping a few other people lose weight. And we've got a total of, so I think we've got three people in total who've lost about 60 kilos. So for those of you in America who don't understand kilos, so 20 kilos per person is about 45 pounds. Hmm. Interestingly, in America, they did actually switch over to metric for a period of time i think it was like about a year and and then what happened the midwest rebelled and said we ain't doing none of that metric stuff they, they i think it was the inches and centimeters that got them or something and so for a period america kind of went metric and then they swung back over the dark side and abandoned yeah. metrics some places are half and half so you go to uk they're still driving around in miles and in feet and yet they're thinking in terms of kilos and stuff like that so some places yeah. are half half new zealand we, we, we switched over completely. Whatever. I remember I was in school when we changed it. I don't know if you... Do you remember metrics changing? No. No, probably too young. No, I started it's, with metrics. You started with metrics. I remember I was at school, and I can't remember what primer it was, but they confiscated our rulers and gave us new rulers that had inches on that had um, centimetres on it. So they took away all our inch rulers and gave us these new free ones, wow. wooden rulers. Okay. And I remember, too, that they used to use the rulers... This is... I don't know... Try talking 1300. What does that mean? Um, the the rulers, they used to, I, was, I used to get in a bit of trouble at school. And they this teacher, she would hold your hand down the desk and she'd get this wooden rule and she'd go smack, 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 smack on your knuckles. Ooh. And it was, and it did use, you know, it was a little weak, little weak. <laughs> and, then, and then after that, I discovered the strap. I remember the first time I the first time you are a naughty little bastard. The first time I got the strap, we'd had we started doing these, we called them stone wars, but they weren't. It was little pieces of dirt that we used to take out. They had these like rose gardens in the school. <laughs> we'd take these little bit of dirt, and when it hit the ground, it would kind of explode. Or if you hit someone with it, it would it would kind of explode. So we, it was like it was like shooting people. It was like, oh yeah, we got these bombs. Anyway, so we got told by one of the teachers to stop this or whatever, and then I went 
back out there later that day or something or other and picked up a great big piece and I threw it at this guy I hit him in the back of the head and the singles went <laughs> anyway and a teacher saw it so they took me into the they took me in and strapped me and it did make my eyes water um, the only other one I'll tell you about the strapping was uh, Morning Corey the only one I'll tell you about the strapping we got we had a new principal came in he was a relieving principal because our principal had I, looking at it now I think he <laughs> I think he'd, he did something going on up here. But anyway, he, he left for like six months, had this new principal come in, and he was a big strapping rugby player. And so anyway, I got I got caught doing something, and he's going to strap me. And what he did was, so he took me into, into where it is, and he, he he made me wait for about an hour before he strapped me. And what he did was he, he fussed around, he can't find the strap. Oh, here it is. And then he got it. And he's that is a big, big, tough guy. And he like really launched and went smack down on this desk. And I was like, oh, <laughs> and he makes me wait another half hour. And then finally he comes over, he does a strap. Holy shit, did it hurt. Holy shit. I remember I used to have a technique. What I do is you, you hold your hand really, really slack. And as the strap comes down, you can sort of break it a little bit by moving your hand down. And so I did that on the first one and he saw it. And he said, he said, that one doesn't count. He said he was going to give me three. And so the first one didn't count. He said, you've got to hold your hand still there. And if you don't hold it still, I'm going to put it on the table. <laughs> so anyway, so that's my... That's my uh, that's I my, got strapped for throwing dirt, do you? Did you? <laughs> See, that's, that's, I don't think they do it in schools anymore. Do no. they still strap in America? They got they, they phased it out quite a long time ago now, wasn't yeah. it? I don't know that. It, you know, I think there's other ways to go disciplining kids. Um, although we turned out all right, <laughs> Cal. Cal, I went. I went. Went out to Cal's place the other day to film her eel. So, Cal is just coming along. I reckon you guys should do a weekly agony aunt show. Whatever. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> anyway, so I went to Cal, just so um, I went to Cal's during the week to film some eels. She's got this little creek. It's about. It's only about this wide, and it's got these big eels in it. Um, and but the big one didn't come out. The monster. I went out to film the monster eel. Monster reel didn't show, but the, but the monsters. smaller one, the big one, the monster one's called <laughs> Troll, probably a female one called mm -hmm. Troll, and then there's a smaller one, which could be a male or a female called Bob. Bob showed himself and <laughs> ate a bit of stuff. Um, anyway, uh, so enough about that. What are we moved on to? So, oh, so weight loss. So next week, Jace and I are going to give you the full rundown. Anyone who wants to lose weight on what you have to do. Um, and I, <laughs> in fact, what prompted this? So Larry Routledge. Some of, you, some of you will know Larry. He's he's in South Africa. He was on he was on our crew in Antarctica. So what happened was Larry was my engineer. We were faffing around at at a there was a, a rally in the Florentine Forest over which is in Tasmania, over the old growth trees being logged by this company Guns for paper. And you know, clearing old old growth trees and making paper out of sucks. So we went to this rally. It was about a, probably a couple of thousand people. It was massive. Um, and they had there was Xavier Rudd and a few other musicians paid. Anyway, Larry and I were, were muck, mucking around. We had a big log that was pivoting on on another log, and he's on one end, I'm on that, and we're rocking it, trying to knock each other off. Larry fell off, broke his ribs. He he was my replacement that came down to Antarctica. What a what a bonus <laughs> that was. <laughs> and then Larry came and joined later, and then Larry also went on a subsequent campaign. Anyway, Larry has lost quite a bit of weight as well. Um, Oh, we got something from Brazil here. I can't. I'm not Portuguese, not so much. I'm afraid. Um, morning, Vivian. I think Vivian's lost some weight, hasn't she? Yeah, I think she's uh, she's been chipping away at it. Little Vivian, by little. how much you lost? Anyway, <laughs> um, so Larry has lost 15 kilos, and uh, he sent he sent me this text during the week, and he said now he's he's all cock and ribs. <laughs> <laughs> God, well done, Larry. 15 kilos gone. 15 kilos. See, that would be. That would be not much gut left at all, because Larry and yeah. Larry in Philippines, like he, Larry likes his food and he eats a lot, <laughs> and he put on a lot of weight in the Philippines. So he went back in, kind of like you when you were at your fighting weight, you had yeah quite a big belly. There's nothing that left now, is there? No, it's pretty. Uh... Oh, solid <laughs> as a rock. Right. Anyway, now we're going to move on to um, water quality. Now, what prompted this was I, there was a guy. Vivian <laughs> says she's. She's not all cock and ribs. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not, Vivian. <laughs> so I had a guy many years ago. There was a there was a lady I met on a flight. It was from it was a flight Miami to London. There was this lady sitting next to me, and she she was from Fort Myers, and she was the 
She was the like publicity person for the Fort Myers tourism agency. And and it's a really good lesson for you about like I whenever I get on a plane, I always try and speak to whoever's next to me and have a chat with them. And a couple of my sponsors have actually come from doing this. Anyway, this lady, we just we chatted on the flight or whatever, and then we kept in touch after then. And she called me up once and she said, um, if you ever come to come back to um, Fort Myers area, can you come and take a look at why our water quality is so so bad here? And what they had was so Fort Myers, so on the panhandle in America, you've got this sort of big stick of land sticking down. Fort Myers is over here, and there's this canal that sort of goes from the middle over, and you can drive from one side. We took the boat through the Okeechobee Canal, which goes from one side of Florida to the other, and there's like these locks that allow you to go through. But it's because the pan is very flat, there's not a lot of throughput of water. Anyway, Fort Myers has got this massive algae problem, and, it, and Fort Myers is a tourism location. It's got all these tourists coming there to um, swim in the water, but there's all this, and the water had gone green at one stage, and it got all red, and and then the, the marinas are all choked up with algae, whatever. So she said, can you come and have a look at it? So I went there and had a look, and there was like, in the space of about half a day, it was it, it was really, really obvious. Firstly, sugar plantations. So they've got heaps of sugar plantations, and it's kind of good land for sugar plantations if you simply look at at production but the the downside with sugar is they use a lot of fertilizers a huge amount of fertilizers to keep growing the sugar so you firstly you've got these farms that are putting all these fertilizers in so so that didn't take long to figure that out and then the second one was they had there was a whole lot of cattle there and the cattle are walking in the creek so in, to put in perspective in new zealand if a farmer gets caught warning dan if a farmer gets caught with cattle in in a waterway in new zealand Normally, there's a fine between ten and twenty thousand dollars for them to be caught. Now, not all farms, that some of the dry stock stations in the high country, they're still allowed to have their animals in there. But that's gradually changing too. So, but as a general rule, if you go allowing a cow to go walking through your creek and shooting at it, it's just that is just going to sweep on down, and it's all going to get converted into algae. Um, and algae you don't want. You want your water to be really clear and clean with low levels of nutrients. Farming goes introducing these additional nutrients, right? So so farming is part of it, and let, especially allowing cattle. Sheep, not as bad, but cattle are bad news and creeks and stuff. So there was that going on. Then there was, and so what I did, she picked me up at the airport, and we drove from one side of the panhandle to the other across this area. And so we saw that, and then there was all this roadworks, right? And there's no there's no collection of so the roadworks they had all these big D8 bulldozers that so they're bulldozing a road sweeping all the topsoil to the side or whatever, and it was pissing with rain and all this topsoil is just sweeping straight into the waterways and so topsoil has nutrients and you know it's quite rich and stuff so suddenly you've got that happening and then we went through a city and the same thing there's all these developments so everyone everyone in America wants to live where it's warm now rightly so. There were a whole lot of them are moving south. So there's this like this this flight of people from the northern part of America heading south because it's warmer down south. And so they're all heading down to Florida and building all these new houses. And they're just sitting there with a the dirt sweeping it all to the side. No containment of it. So to put in perspective, in New Zealand last night, there's there's some there's a big motorway they're putting in down here. And Jason and I went down and had a look at it. In fact that we had a lady have a little go at us. <laughs> so we went <laughs> we um so we went and parked our car. So there's, they've, they've got a petition section where they're putting this motorway in. And then there was about 20 metres where there's a road was. And we went and parked there. And there's a busy road going past. And we just parked on the side. And this lady comes on and she's got a fluoro vest on. You know, shoved your car. And, <laughs> and I, was, I looked at her and I was like, you got no jurisdiction here. And, she, and what she had, there were some trucks coming out. So I think she was worried about us blocking her truck. But there's, there's, a, million, there's a million feet of road. Like, you, yeah. you don't need us to move. And she came over <laughs> and she was, she was pretty angry. I, I said, look, you got no jurisdiction. Your, your place finishes up there. Where you go. <laughs> and then that she got it worse. And then she, yeah, and then that's it. Yeah, and that made, then she just got all, got all right up. And I, I think I said to her, you got out of the wrong side of the bend this morning, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. It's an angry little... That's what happens today, isn't it? You give someone a fluoro vest. It used to be a white coat and a badge. It's changed now. Give them a fluoro vest and suddenly they've got all this... All They have got think they're all powerful and got jurisdiction over a public road, like spearmen. Anyway, so we went down to the check... We just went down to check out this road and we, we the motorway they're putting in. And they've got these catchment things so that all of the earthworks, when it rains, 
it gets caught up in a in like a pond if you like and it all settles there so it doesn't go sweeping out in the creeks um whereas in florida there was none of that going on there was you know it was you know whatever earthquakes it doesn't matter that it comes in and rains um so so there was that going on then there was in the cities you've got all of these plush lawns so especially you know older people they like their little gardens and lawns and stuff and you're driving through so somewhere like some parts of some parts of florida i oh, sorry fort lauderdale very wealthy people beautiful big manicured lawns and palm trees and whatever all putting all their fertilizers on to keep your lawns going and you'll see as you drive along there's all these all these hispanic people on minimum wage or being paid under the table normally putting fertilizers on the lawns and and so cities are bad news C- cities are bad news for waterways in two two respects one is is the, uh, the the phosphates and nitrates they put on the fertilizers and stuff on the lawns, and the second one is all the pollution, you know, all the all the scraps and waste and chemicals and stuff that comes out of cities. Um, so there was that. Then there's drainage of the swamps. So a big ch- big chunk of Florida has has had all the swamps drained, um, and they do this. This has happened a fair bit in New Zealand. We're only starting to realise the value of swamps now. Um, so swamps are swamps are so if you've got all this runoff and it goes into a swamp area, swamps have very high um, biodensity and also or biomass, and they also have very high biodiversity. So you've got so many little critters and stuff go living in there, and in many ways these things act as like a filter. Similar thing for mangroves. So mangroves in New Zealand, everyone hates them. People hate, and they in fact over at, at Tyra where my where my mum used to live. There was the, they went in there and there was a campaign to cut down all the mangroves. So mangroves are sort of nature's way of trying to fight back. There's all this extra nutrients in the water. Mangroves will help to suck those up and use them. But people people want to have a nice clean beach rather than a mangrove. Um, but if you don't have things like mangroves, so you cut them all out, then at least the algal blooms and other things. Um, so swamps affect that all around the world. We, we, we've drained so many swamps and converted them to housing other thing and you know the same's happened in Florida enormous areas of swamp have been have basically been been drained put in hard fill and mm. you know put up the houses and all all the rest of it kind of thing um so and that's so drainage of swamps and roading yeah so those those are the main contributors to it so no, the, only, the reason I brought it up was a guy messaged me after the guns thing last week and he said I value opinion on guns have you got anything to say about Lake Air um, so Lake Erie is one of the great lakes in America, and it's got it's got some big cities. I think like Buffalo, I think Cleveland, Toledo. So there's a few big cities around around the lake. So anyway, so I said, yeah, I'll have a quick look. So I went on Google Earth. You look at Lake Erie. It's kind of like this, completely surrounded by farmland. All right. So if there's no bush around it left. So if you tell, what was that creek you were telling us about the other day? There was a creek that had two forks, or it had a fork coming in it. So yeah, it's a, a tributary to the Wairoa River, which is pretty murky anyway so it's near which, where my which, dad lives so Dargaville oh, yep. general area Dargaville so yeah you've got one one stream coming down through farmland one coming through the bush and you, there's a, a place called the Twin Bridges where there's a T-shaped bridge so it crosses both streams it's quite a unique bridge and if you stand there you can see the two streams mixing one's clear and one's dirty there you go mm. so if you've got we well, have got bush and stuff generally the water coming through there is quite clear and you know if you go out in the, in the blocks in New Zealand and the you know back up in the high country where there's no farming these guys are bored with water quality. They want to go back to cougars. They want to go back to cougars. That's right. Did I miss the cougars? Dan Grant, you did miss the cougars. There's a there's a few of them on the wall at the moment, actually. But our end conclusion was good on them. You know, if you've got a 40 or 50-year-old woman who can pick herself up a 25-year-old boyfriend, good on her. Um, you know, it's been like that for men long enough. You know, it's just an evening up of the... There's not a term for men, is there? What do you call... No. Yeah. They call the... The woman, the cougar. The woman are called a no cougar. What do you call a what do you call mm. a man who does that? Mm. There probably are some names, but <laughs> <laughs> especially Sle- if they're getting them from Thailand or Sleazy. the Philippines. <laughs> Sleazy. <laughs> yeah. mm. Andrew Westlake, he hosted us in um, Warrnambool, actually a cool little town in Australia. I think his um, I think his daughter just graduated. Play toy, I think. Dan Green played to Larry. <laughs> nice one, ZJ. Larry, we were discussing you. So Larry, who I mentioned before, he's the guy who just said now he's just cocking ribs. <laughs> he's just come online. <laughs> a great line, Larry. 
So Larry is one. Larry is not one of the guys who have been advising on weight loss. I think he's he's decided to figure it out himself. Um, he, I, yeah, he's figured out you have to go a bit hungry. <laughs> I do, Lauren Wilger fit lectures. So a, so a, so a forty five year old man with a twenty year old daughter, a twenty year old um, girlfriend is lecherous, whereas a forty five year old woman with a twenty year old boyfriend. Is a cougar. <laughs> yeah. That's slightly sexist, I'd suggest. A cradle robber. A dirty old man. <laughs> See, Larry's Larry had a he's had a couple of young girlfriends. Yeah. Mmm. Mm. See, I, I don't know, if that's fair to call Larry that. He's had a couple of older ones too. He was so Larry actually there's an equal opportunity. So so Larry Routler's right, right while he's online. So I wrote this book after after I got back from Antarctica. I better just have a coffee before I tell you the story. <laughs> after I got back from Japan, I wrote this book. And there was this period of time when Larry was, when he first joined me on Earth Race, he, he split up from his girlfriend. And he said, he's a, he said, I'm like a bull elephant. Apparently what bull elephants do is, so, so <laughs> this is, I think African elephants, they probably do the same in Asia, but anyway, the African mm. elephants, the bull elephants, they just kind of go and do their own thing. M- m- many of them, like the big old males, they don't want to faff around with the babies and, and whatever. And they just go off and they're generally the ones that cause all the trouble. So they'll pull down fences and they'll come in and dig up d- dig up the, the pipes that are bringing water out of the bores and stuff like that. They just go and wreak havoc. And they don't really give a shit about anything. They just go and do their own thing. And then every now and then they need to have a bit of sex. And so they'll probably sniff one. Do elephants come in season? I don't know. Bounty. Anyway, but we're no, not sure, I'm not sure whether elephants are up for sex all the time, like humans, or whether they whether they have to be in season. Anyway, every now and then, the point I'm getting at, the, the bull elephant, and Larry says slander, the bull <laughs> elephant, he decides, I'm going to have a bit of sex. So he'll come romping around, he'll find a couple of females and have a go or whatever, and he just goes back off and, and does his own thing right. So... So I, I, and Larry said to me, I think it was one stage when we were on the boat, and he said, you know, you, Pete, you and me, we're just bull elephants. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyway, I wrote, I wrote that in a chapter in my book about Larry saying he's a bull elephant and every now and then he needs to head out and have a bit of sex rather than that. It doesn't really. <laughs> and anyway, so then <laughs> he got this. So his, his, his partner, Eleanor, um, she, I think at one stage, I think, I don't think Larry didn't marry her, did he? They're not married. No, I don't. But they were. To, they've been together for like probably ten years or something like that. Eight years, quite a long time. But anyway, her, her, her she pa- is. Eleanor is that Eleanor? There she is. So <laughs> Eleanor's parents got to read the book. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Uh. <laughs> it's called Being in Musk. Oh, there. I'm not sure if that's. Is that an elephant in heat is in musk? Or if that's Larry being a bull elephant? Or <laughs> no, no, not quite in front of us. This is we've got so we've got Larry the bull elephant on here and we've got Eleanor who, who managed to tame him. <laughs> you know, I think Larry did say that there was a few awkward moments um, with, with Eleanor's parents. I think I think it was the dad. Yeah, the dad, you can imagine you you know <laughs> Eleanor your your favourite daughter, yeah. and then you've you've got this you know what and Larry can come across quite respectable at times, mm. and then he reads about him being a bull <laughs> elephant and needing to head off and have some sex occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> All right, oh right, Larry Routledge, <laughs> must is when a bull gets all horny. Okay, so. Yeah. It seems like Larry get, occasionally he gets must. Eleanor came along, swept him off his feet, and 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 the the must got more controlled. I expect. <laughs> <laughs> Just speculating. <laughs> <laughs> At least this is turning into pure debauchery. <laughs> right. So I've got coming up. I've got amazing four months coming up. Actually, more like close to five. So I've got. Four weeks in the Philippines. So some of you might remember last year I got to train up. They, they, they gave me a couple of Navy SEALs, some BFAR, which is like fisheries guys, some Bantai Daggett, which is local police. Uh, and then there was some a couple of governors, um, sort of like uh, some security team. So I got to train them all up on fisheries. And we went out, had some great, had some great bus, especially that the 
boat, the Dan Israel R, which was a big Danish sailing boat. Um, and so I'm going back there for four weeks. So I've got I've got that same. It's new guys, but from similar units that I'm training up. Four weeks there. Also going to get to a couple other parts of Philippines, and then I have four weeks in Cambodia. Really interesting place. Cambodia has a Cambodia fishery is still relatively rich compared to much of Asia, um, but the the it's being hit a lot by Vietnamese boats that are coming in, uh, and so the, generally the fisheries enforcement in Cambodia is pretty lax. So I've got four weeks there, which would be really cool. Then we have the Earth Race reunion in in UK in Southampton, happening at um, the Manor. Uh, the top list, top list place, and also Church's Fire, they got a big party on the Saturday that we're piggybacking on that. So that's going to be into July, and then I've got a month in Mabello, Isla de Mabello, which is an island 300 kilometres offshore from Colombia. Um, one of the greatest dive sites in the world. There's a new NGO that's setting up that's wanting to go out and start doing um, enforcement. So uh, about... Three or four years ago, first started getting shark finners turning up there. The guy thinks they were Chinese, but no one seems to. It depends who you talk to. Uh, anyway, so they're, so they're setting up a new unit to go and um, and do fisheries there. So I get there right at the start and hopefully train up some train up the team there and get them working on fisheries. And then I have a month in an undisclosed location in the middle of the Pacific. Middle of the Pacific, South Pacific is the best kind of part of ocean in the world in my opinion it's got all these beautiful little islands or whatever really rich fishery weather's nice except when there's a cyclone uh and what's happened around the world is if you look at for example the first first main ocean that really got cleared out like up around the grand banks north atlantic that got cleaned out portuguese spanish greek american canadian vessels went and cleaned that out and then what's happened is those boats kind of moved around a lot of Spanish and Portuguese boats went down to Africa, started fishing there. What's happened in the last decade or two, the Asian fleets have suddenly realised there's, there's all this money to be made mm. and with their burgeoning population, especially China. China, you know, one and a half billion people to try and feed. So their fishing fleet is now massive. And so they've spread out all around the world. And what's happened is the South Pacific was the last area that, the last major area outside of Antarctica that really got hit by this. So, and so a lot of the Pacific fishery is still quite healthy, unlike much of the Atlantic and other areas. So do, you, do you remember when the the fishing of tuna up in, I think it might have been Fiji, all of a sudden started affecting the sport fishery down here in New Zealand? We saw that when, one of the times we left New Zealand on Earth Race, we went to Fiji and a cyclone came through. And there was over 40 boats turned up in, in Suva to shelter out through the cyclone. All fishing boats, all fishing boats, and um, most there were Chinese and Taiwanese. Um, there was one European boat, I can't remember where it was from, but anyway, it was over 40 boats turned up there. And I mean, I went down, I was talking to the, to the port captain. In those days, I wasn't really, you know, I was, you know, doing earth race around the world thing. We weren't involved in fisheries. But I remember thinking, you know, what are these boats catching and anyway that i went and and chatted to the harbour master there and he said every time we have a cyclone all these boats will go turning up um and he said they were, they were all per sainer so per sainer to explain it for you so the boat will um they'll get a net out the back of the boat they'll get a small like a runabout and they'll drag the net out around a school of tuna and then they, they pull on the bottom. This is hence so it's like a purse closing on the bottom. And then they pull them in and haul them all out. So that's a purse sainer. So there was over 40 purse sainers working the yellowfin tuna stocks offshore from Fiji. And so that was like about, it was about 5, 12, 13 years ago now that I first saw it. In those days, you used to get yellowfin in New Zealand. And each year, they weren't highly targeted here, but... It was, it was recreational fishermen used to go and catch them down. Fokatani, you know, yeah. So Fokatani and also a Potokini out offshore from there. They'd go and catch yellowfin. And each year they might weigh in maybe two or three hundred of these yellowfin. So on a big day, then someone might catch 50. And then over the... So what's happening is, so these you've got all these tuna up around Fiji, Samoa, Tonga, New Caledonia. As the water's warm in summer, that those schools move south in that warm water down into New Zealand. So they were just edging into New Zealand's waters and that was where Bay of Plenty was where it was happening. Over the period of the next five years, completely gone. Completely gone. So now, down in fucking I think this year they did catch maybe 10 or 20 but generally in the last few years there's been zero. Zero yellowfin caught um, mm -hmm. and much of it because of those fleets that cleaned it out and, and you know, you're getting 
what they term localised extinction. Certain areas yeah. being completely cleaned out. What's the elephant. distance from there, from Fokotani to Fiji? What sort of distance we're we talking? Oh, 2,000 nautical miles. Yeah, it's a long way, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's a long mm. way. So this migration, it's a yearly thing. As the waters move south, these yellowfin would come down and then move back up north. Um, and so it's, so anyway, I got, I've got a month in one of these islands. I don't want to say it because this island, if I go revealing where it is, if I tell you I'm going to the Philippines, there's so many areas that, you know, it's not like fishermen will know. But I don't want to go saying where that island is. But if there's anyone anyone who's keen to come on any of those campaigns, I think the Mopello one, I can't take anyone. But the other the other three locations, Tropical Island, Middle of the Pacific, um, Philippines, Cambodia. I could take one or two one or two extras potentially if someone wants to go and they, they can pay their airfares and a bit of food and whatever. So if anyone wants to go, then uh, then make sure you message me, right? Oh, we've got a visitor. Ooh. You better get that. <laughs> better do. Got a vote. Who could it be? Awesome. Oh, that'll be Jason. Jason's got this coffee machine, and he's been waiting for this for this plug that allows him to get his coffee machine going. Is there anything else? Oh, Earth Race Two update on Earth Race Two. Still fundraising. Ten million dollars. Need to pull it in. Make sure they come on. <laughs> we should have bought. We should have bought them in. Anyway, I think that's. Is there anything else we need to cover? We covered Earth Race 2, upcoming campaigns, There's always Philippines, next Cambodia, Reunion, <laughs> 6th, 5th to the 7th of July in UK near Southampton. Uh, open to pretty much anyone who's been involved in Earth Race at any stage. Even you. You would slip into that if you wished. Trump is this more busy time of year. It's a, bu- it's a busy winter, time winter, of year. Yeah. He kind of has a job, sort of. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, and we'll then my we'll we'll pillow, and then... Um, <laughs> and then a tropical island. It sounds like it just sounds like I'm on big holiday, doesn't it? I'm keeping them in suspension. He wants me to open the package. <laughs> it doesn't look that exciting. No, it's not that exciting, Dan. To... And I'm not going to explain it either. Oh my there you Lord. go. I'll leave you guessing. Oh no. <laughs> all right. Anyway, that's all from us. Thank you for tuning in. Love oh, thanks for all the birthday wishes. It wasn't my birthday during the week. Um, Hilo- oh, hang on, let me just, I'll just show them something. It's on my door, right? <laughs> so my daughter, Alicia, she's a, she's a great little chef and baker and whatever. She was making, she was making muffins, right? And, and she, <laughs> mine, she, she said she was a bit tired or whatever. And so what she did, so this is my muffin. She just made it a loaf. <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't be bothered putting it into the into the small muffins. So anyway, that was that was my present from uh, from from Alicia. I quite um, like the idea. It's efficient. It is efficient. Like, it's not a lot of work to go making that. Well, it's, in terms of putting up the mix, but it means there's not as much of the faffing around making mm. little wee bobs and putting them in. So anyway, that was that was from from Alicia. I just tell my girls not to get me presents. Actually, uh, mm. last year they got me a knife, which is great. But I'm not really big on presents. I sort of find often the stuff that I don't need or use. You know, like I've I've got my Zodiac and my MVGs and a knife. What more does a man need, really? <laughs> um, but anyway, so and, and there was some of the team. If you go on my wall, there was a video that the team put together, um, all sort of wishing me happy birthday, which is which is really nice. And I'd much rather get that than a present of something that I probably won't use, um, it, with the exception being a a, a man's. I don't know, it's more a loaf than a muffin, really, isn't it? It is. <laughs> we should we should crack that and have a bit for morning tea. Yeah, we should. We should have had with our coffee. <laughs> Maybe we'll have that next week when we talk. Anyway, next week we're going to talk about weight loss. Dan Green, you got a couple of kilos to come off that belly of yours, I'd suggest. Probably a couple others on there. No easy options, though. Anyway, I think that's all from us. Um, thanks for tuning in. Uh, thank you, Jason, for, for your inimitable... Input, <laughs> <laughs> and we will uh, we'll see you next week. Yeah. Rightio, see you, Dan. Just see if we missed anyone. Corey Blair, coffee with Captain Pete. There we go. Rightio, take care, team. Love yous, and thanks for tuning in. Make sure you share this. All right. See ya. <laughs>